All right, we're going to shift gears, and we're going to open God's Word. Um, we've already been worshiping, but we're going to shift into a different mode of worship now as we look at God's Word together. And I want to start by tell, asking you to think about someone that you would define as generous, and not just with money, generous with their time, generous with their talent, generous with their skills, what they're good at. You know the type. First to grab the bill at dinner, willing to spend their Saturday helping you fix your leaky faucet. Here's someone can't make ends meet and just kind of quietly takes care of the bill. Shows up with a meal, offers a ride, lends a hand. Someone who is generous. Generous people in our lives bless us in huge ways. Agreed? Now, you might be thinking most of this is just what it means to be a good friend, that the generous people in my life are just my good friends. And you're right. Friends are all those things. And it's hard to imagine, at least for me, a healthy, loving friendship without generosity as a part of it. Friday afternoon, I got a call from a good friend who is known for being incredibly generous with her time and talents. I've been the recipient of her generosity on countless occasions. And when she said she needed help, that night, like right then, like she wanted to pick me up in an hour, and she wasn't sure how long it would take, I volunteered to go with her because she had volunteered to help somebody else, and she needed help with what she had volunteered to help with. Right? Have you ever gotten yourself into that kind of a pickle? It ended up taking almost five hours. And she kept saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I totally owe you dinner. I'm going to take you out. I'm so sorry. And I kept looking at her and saying, no, you don't. You're my friend. It's what friends do. And that's not to pat me on the back. That's just the reality, right? Good friends help each other. She doesn't owe me anything. She gave me the opportunity to help. The same can be said, I think, of our relationship, our friendship with God. Now, it's obviously a little bit different. It's a bit more like generosity between a parent and a child. But even in a parent-child relationship, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully there comes a point when things become a bit more reciprocal. And when there's a little bit more give and take, right? All of us parents are going, hopefully, please, Lord Jesus, let that be. Right? So the underlying idea here, I think, is the same. God is astoundingly generous toward us. Not because he has to be, but because he loves us and he chooses to be generous. And when we are generous with what we have, because of our love for God, which is possible only because of God's love for us, how about that for a circular argument, it's a really good sign, right? When we give of our time because we're growing in our relationship with God and we recognize that everything we have is a gift from him, it's a sign of health in our relationship to the giver. When we offer our skills and our talents for the sake of others and for the sake of what God is doing to redeem creation, it's a sign of health in our relationship with the creator. And when we're generous with our money, it's a healthy sign of our looking more and more and more like our generous God. Let's back up just a minute. Last week we talked about the fact, and it really is a fact, that you and I are rich. We're rich. We may not feel rich by our culture's standards. In fact, some of us might be struggling to find any kind of margin when it comes to our finances. But we are, compared to most of the world's population, rich. $48,000 a year. That's the number. You want to know what number that is? $48,000 a year puts you in the top 1% percent of the world's population in terms of income earners. 48,000. Top one percent. We're rich. 
our money makes us wealthy, I think, also in terms of our time and our talent. We're not just talking about money today. Most of us don't have to work nearly as much as most people around the world. That's a fact. We may choose to work an 80-hour a week, but for the most part, it's a choice. It's because of the kind of lifestyle we've decided that we need to support. I'm talking to myself here. It's intentional. Most of us, not all of us, but most of us can get food and housing and insurance and pay our utilities with something closer to a 40-hour work week. So that means we have more time on our hands than people in a lot of places around the world. We really have been given so much. And Jesus said, to whom much is given, what? Much is required. Much is expected. The exact context of that widely used phrase, both inside and outside of the church, isn't directly about money. I know that. For all you Bible scholars out there, I know it. But I'm willing to go out on a limb and say that Jesus would be okay with us using it here in this context, right? Because the basic idea is that we are held responsible for what we have. If we're blessed with talents and wealth and knowledge and time and other things like that, put in whatever category you want, it's expected that we will use them well to glorify God and to benefit others. That's the expectation as followers of Jesus. In other words, we are expected to be generous. Last week we talked about what it means to honor God with what we have. Recognizing it's not what we have that's important, it's what we do with what we have. And we focused on a few of the pitfalls of being rich. We talked about discontentment. We talked about having enough but not disciplining ourselves to allow enough to give us margin. And we talked about the migration of hope, which is the tendency to shift our hope from being in God, the provider, to being in our things or in our talents or in our extra time, the things God provides for us. It's that migration of hope. This is directly connected, connected these pitfalls, to our conversation today about generosity. It's almost as if we planned it, right? If we don't accept the fact that we're rich, and if we are unwilling to fight against the pitfalls of being rich, we will allow our hope to migrate from God the provider to the things that God provides. It will happen. And the byproduct of that migration will be another migration, if you will, away from generosity to lives that are very self-centered. The Bible is clear that generosity is a character trait that we carry, you and I carry, because we are image bearers of God. And our God is incredibly generous, as we said. It is, we're talking about the core of our life. This is not an optional conversation. But living a generous lifestyle isn't easy. It's not easy. The struggle goes deep in us. And that is especially true when we talk about generosity with our finances. How many of you, raise your hand if you would love to be known as below average? Just generally speaking. Come on. Anybody? I love to be, no, we, nobody would admit to wanting to be in life generally below average, right? That's not something that sounds very appealing. But I need to tell you, and I'm telling myself this as I tell it to you, these are some hard words, they're kind of cut to the core, that when it comes to giving, chances are pretty good that the richer you are, the more likely it will be that you will be a below average giver. As hard as this is to believe, studies show, and we always believe studies, right? We don't always believe studies, but we can believe this statistic. That the more financially blessed you are, the smaller percentage of what you have you actually give. Right, here's a study. The average, actually these are just statistics, but they come out of a study. The average American gives about, do you know how much they give? Average American, 3%. 
to charity. That's the average. It's not an awesome statistic given how rich we are as a country. But still higher than the, it's still higher than those earning <clears throat> between 100 and 200,000 who give away an average of 2.6% to charity. I'm not a mathematician, but that's lower, right? But people who make below $10,000 a year, do you know how much on average they give to charity? 5.2. Again, not a mathematician, but that's higher. 5.2%. That's $520 a year. That's $43 a month for people who were only making $833 a month. That's huge. So why is it that the more we have, the less by percentage we're likely to give? We said the problem goes deep, and it does. By nature, we're selfish. Who's selfish? Okay, there better be hands on this one, right? By nature, I want to trust my money. I can see it. I can feel it. I can touch it. By nature, I want to do with my time what I want to do with my time. By nature, we want security, and by nature, we often equate security with having more and more and more of all of those three things, time, talent, treasure. So when we get more money, when we get that raise or when we get the, the bonus or whatever, we're thrilled. We're often relieved thinking, oh my gosh, now I can make it. But rather than allowing more money to provide more margin... We usually upgrade our life, right? Thinking that more is always for us. More things, more trips, more accumulation, more, more, more for me. Which brings up the question. It's a really important one. Because we've, we've declared that we're all rich by the world's standards. So why did God make you rich? Why did God have you live in Baltimore, Maryland in a country that allows you to be rich by the world's standards? If we were to answer the question based on what we observe, just by what we see, it seems that the reason is in order to have more and to buy more. But that's not the right answer, is it? And that's not the biblical answer. We all know that. Last week we looked at a bit of 1 Timothy 6. It's a passage that we're going to kind of build on a little bit through this series. And last, it's a, it's a passage where the Apostle Paul instructs Timothy, which, who's this kind of kid, essentially, this guy that he's bringing along and mentoring, apprenticing um, in what it means to be in ministry and to be spreading the gospel. And he's giving, um, training Timothy to give very, very specific message to rich people that he's talking to. Now remember, that's us, okay? And one of our key verses in this section, verse 17, says that God has richly provided us with everything for our enjoyment. You didn't expect me to go there, did you? That's right. It's there in Scripture. God wants us to enjoy what we have. There is nothing unspiritual about enjoying the blessings of God. There's nothing wrong with that. Just like a father who would bless his children, God wants his children to be blessed. That's you and me. He wants us to enjoy what we have, but he also wants us, and this is crucial, to realize that what he has given is not all for us. God wants us to be generous. The very next verse, 1 Timothy 6, 18, tells us, command them to do good. Now I want you to notice, Paul doesn't say, command them to be good. Everybody is commanded to be good, right? Whether you're rich or you're not, whether you live on a dollar a day or you live on $500 a day or $1,000, everybody is commanded to be good. We are commanded here, those who are rich, again, that's us, to do good. He's talking specifically to rich people and he's saying, hey, there are specific things that you are able to do that other people cannot do because you are rich. Because you have margin. 
because you have time, because you have money. And specifically, he says, this verse goes on, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be, say it with me, generous. In other words, don't just be an average do-gooder. That's what Paul's saying here. Be an above-average do-gooder, and none of you raised your hands on wanting to be a below-average do-gooder, or just below-average in general. So I'm trusting that you'd like to be up in this category as well. And he says this, he says, because the more you have been blessed, the more you have, and the more opportunity you have to do good than the average person. And the point is this. Those of us who have extra, have extra possibility. Those of us who have extra, have extra possibility. So the Apostle Paul says, I want you to be rich, not average, in the right things. I want you to be rich in the right things. I want you to be rich in good deeds. Because the richer, the wealthier you become, the more opportunity you have to do good for other people. If you're a person now, you might be sitting there thinking, she's just talking about money. It's all she's talking about. If you're a person who doesn't like church because you think church is always talking about money, it's all we want, I want you to hang with me. Because I'm not talking about money here only. And I'm not talking about giving to the church only. There is that important part of what we're talking about. But that's not the point here. The point is we're talking about how to keep our hope from migrating to something as uncertain as what we have, as our wealth. Because you and I both know that it can just go poof and be gone. I think this is right where we get back to the principles that we've been talking about here at Central for a couple of years now. The language we've been using. We've been intentional, talking about being intentional about being generous. We have to be intentional. Whether we're talking about our time or our talent or our treasure, we will not just, I have to you, we will not accidentally fall into generosity. We will not accidentally write that check. We will not accidentally volunteer our time. We, we will not accidentally volunteer to do things for our friends. It, you have to be intentional about it. Intentional in generosity. That's usually the way we spend our time and our money. Intentionally, right? We're usually, as a people, very intentional. We're certainly intentional consumers. You might clip coupons. If you're like me, you look for sales, and then you go buy it, and then you see that it's on sale for something less, so you go back and you get the price adjustment. That doesn't accidentally happen. I have to think about that. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you do it too. If we scheme to consume, why don't we scheme to give? If we think about what we consume and what we buy and how we spend our time and how we spend our money, why don't we do that when it comes to generosity? That's really the question, right? Let's look at 2 Corinthians. If you've got your Bible, it's on page 1058. We're going to look at chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. Listen to the word of God. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have scattered abroad their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through your generosity will result in thanks, through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, 
but it is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, people will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this, his indescribable gift. Friends, Paul is talking about, to the people in Corinth, about their generosity in supporting those in ministry. They've been generous, and he is buttoning up this conversation. He's kind of closing it out, and his message is really clear. We reap what we sow, stinginess or generosity. We should give because we want to, not because we have to or out of, the scripture says, out of compulsion because we're compelled to. We are called to be intentional in our giving. Again, time, talent, treasure. Verse 7, because you've decided in your heart to give. Decided, beforehand, intentional. This is where our language about active givers being intentional comes from. Godly generosity with our time and our talent is deliberate. It is decided. And God loves when we can do this cheerfully because we want to. Because the cheerfulness in our attitudes is evidence that our hope has not migrated to the wrong place. And when Paul says in verse 8 that God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, have, that's a lot of alls, having all that you need, read that with me, you will abound in every good work. Not you will have all the money in the world. This is not a prosperity gospel. Not you will have all the time in the world but that you will abound in every good work. It sounds a lot like what we read or looked at just a minute ago out of Timothy. And the idea is really simple. God pours his blessing on us so that we can pour it on others. Amen? And here's the really incredible promise with all of this. This is an exciting and abundant way to live counterintuitive. Giving away what we have doesn't sound like it would be an abundant way to live, but it is an abundant way to live. 2 Corinthians 9 11. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through your generosity, through us, again, the, Paul and others, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Did you see that? It's full circle. It's full circle. We give. God gives more. For us, a little bit, but no. Why? So that we sow more. So that we reap more. We give. God gives more to us so we can give more. People are blessed. We are blessed. And most importantly, the name of God is blessed. When we give, others see it. If we're going to respond well to God's call on our lives, we have got to be intentional. And the way that we most often talk about this, the very simple way, we're not going to spend much time on this, most of you know it, is that we talk about this in terms of a tithe. And again, please keep in mind, I am not just talking about money. We certainly are talking about money, but I think we need to be intentional in talking about a tithe of our time and a tithe of our talent, what God's given us that we're good at. A tithe is just a biblical word for giving 10% of what we have back to the work of God. Back to God's people so that the name of God will be blessed. In tithing, you give a percentage right off the top. The Bible talks about first fruits in an intentional way to the church and to other ministries that point people to Jesus. I think, I think 10% is an interesting number. I don't know if you've thought about this, but... It's enough that you've got to think about it, right? You've got to think about it. It requires planning and kind of reorienting your life to say, I'm going to give 10% of my time and my talent and my treasure away. It's not for me. 
And it's a good example of what we're called to in general, with our lives, where we're focused first on generosity, and then we figure out how everything else fits in. Most of us do it the other way around. I do most often. Like, what do I have to get done today? For me, or for my kids, or for my husband, or for our family, or for my work. Then if I have extra time, then I'll think about doing something extra, right? Or we do the same with our money, or we do the same with our skills. Between you and me, I think 10% is just a really good guideline. I think we can sometimes get caught up in the numbers. But I don't think actually God is sitting up there thinking, okay, 10% of 48,000 is, you know, like the exact numbers on it. I don't think God's doing that with us. What concerns God is our hearts. And giving generously works on our hearts. It changes us. It teaches us to prioritize God. It teaches us to prioritize our faith. Now, you may be thinking, I want to give, but there's no way that I can give 10%. That's okay. Remember, it's where your heart is. Start small, whatever it feels like, and then maybe just, it's possible, maybe just a little bit of a stretch. If we only do what feels completely comfortable, are we really in the right place with our heart? I don't think so. But just start somewhere if you're a follower of Jesus and you've never given before. Start somewhere. And if you've been giving and you've never, like, in the last however long, kind of re-looked or re-analyzed what you're giving, do that. Look at it. Talk about it. Have an intentional plan, no matter where you are in giving, to move to a higher and higher percentage. Again, I'm not talking about just to the church. I'm not, this is not fundraising. But give it away, because as we increase the percentage larger and larger, it's a direct sign of our health and our deepness with Jesus in our relationship, growing and growing and growing and growing. And here's something for all of us who, generally speaking, have enough. If 90% of what most of us have isn't enough, then maybe that's something helpful for us to think about. It's just a thought. People who give agree 90% with God goes a whole lot further than 100% without God. As we wrap up, I want to just very quickly bring the cross into full view in this discussion because we would be remiss if we didn't. Remember that as followers of Jesus, our generosity is rooted in God's generosity toward us. In Jesus, God was generous beyond imagination. Romans 8.32 says, He, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? All of this talk about our generosity is really just talk about God's lavish generosity and lavish grace toward you and me. If he didn't spare his son, how do we ever think we could outgive God? The reason that we can be generous is because God in Jesus Christ has forgiven us and has wrapped us up in his own family. We are his children. He has assumed responsibility to provide for us graciously and abundantly, enough to enjoy and enough to share. We can give because we are loved. You can give because you are safe in God's care. We are created in the image of God, which is too noble a thing than to do anything less than share what we have abundantly, even as God has shared with us. Let's pray. Lord God, you are generous beyond our imagination, and I thank you for that, and I praise you And I ask that you would help us to be generous, help us to recognize the gifts that come from you, that everything we have is from you, and that the goal of our generosity is that your name will be blessed. So God, we ask that through what we give, even now as we prepare to give, that you would be blessed, that the name of Jesus Christ would be made known, and that others would be folded into your family. 
make us generous. Give us generous hearts, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.